Um, good afternoon and welcome everyone to Tech Futures 2040 Future Projections by Australia's Leading Technologists. Without a doubt, we'll be having mobile phones. Let's begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many lands in which we meet and their continuing connection to land, sea and community. For me here in Sydney, Australia, I pay respects to the Bedigal people of the Eora Nation and their elders past, present and emerging. To all First Nations people joining us today, a very warm welcome. This event is co-hosted by the Australian Society for Computers and the Law and the Australian Information Industry Association. We collectively provide forums for discussing technology, policy, legislation and standards. We represent vibrant communities of professionals across disciplines and sectors, ready to tackle important issues such as, that are, as those that are arising at the intersection of technology, law and society. This is the first of a two part series. Join us on the 28th of October for Common Futures, where we will explore compassion and sustainability by design with representatives from the UN Committee on Rights for Persons with Disabilities and the UN Global Compact, as well as leaders of other civil society groups. Today, you will hear the stuff of science fiction grounded on the science of today. Uh, we're just attempting to change a slide. Um, we have invited our distinguished guests to speak for a, a, around 10 minutes each on their current research, as well as to share their ideas on where that might take us. You also have an opportunity to ask questions by putting your questions in the Q&A function. Please do so. We're keen to answer as many questions as possible. The purpose of this session is to stimulate thought creativity and an appreciation that the future is truly in our hands. If at the end of this hour you feel a little more curious, wiser, have more questions than answers, feel inspired, we have achieved our aim. Let me now introduce you to our moderator for this evening. Ron Gauchi is the current CEO of AIIA. He's also the chairman of Export. He is known as the former CEO of Fed Square, Melbourne Polytechnic, Melbourne Storm and MD of uh, Verizon Australia. He is the, he's a true leader within the ITC industry and has held many senior leadership roles, including with Microsoft, Telstra and IBM. He is on the Australian Chamber of Commerce Board of Governors and is known as the turnaround CEO for his many successes in that area. And he also plays for a cover band called The Big Kahuna. So, John, Ron, so maybe big kahunas, you can correct me, Ron, but now over to you and to introduce our panel. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, Marina. Thanks very much and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very honoured to be able to facilitate this uh, group of esteemed uh, specialists. Uh, I'm looking forward to the, uh, the topics we're going to discuss. As uh, you just heard, everyone will have a, uh, uh, an opportunity to speak to their topic and after I've introduced them and then straight after that, after the uh, four speakers uh, have uh, taken to the virtual stage, we will then have a Q&A session. I've got questions, but I'm sure you have as well. So as you've just heard, make sure your questions come through onto the, uh, uh, the live Q&A area so we can see them and post them to our uh, to our speakers. Uh, as I said, we have a very esteemed panel today and uh, uh, looking forward to hearing what they have to say. So our first speaker is uh, uh, Professor Matt Cooperholtz, and I'd like uh, uh, the professor to come to the, uh, the screen. Uh, Matt is actually PwC's chief data scientist, is formally trained in actuarial science and computer science. Uh, Matt's area of specialization is the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies to uh, detailed and complex data. Um, Matt, I'll uh, invite you to speak to the group and, um, and then uh, I'll uh, sh uh, shift to the next speaker and we'll come back to you for questions. Uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Matt Kuberholz, thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Marina. Uh, so my topic, well, what I'd like to speak to is, is something I've focused on a fair bit over the last couple of years, and this is this idea of responsible AI. 
and the role of, of companies like PwC that traditionally stand for audit and assurance and helping people trust things like financial statements. What role might we have in a world that's uh, driven by AI and helping that happen responsibly? So I'll introduce this idea, um, speaking on a framework that, that, that's not mine, I've borrowed shamelessly from some other futures when we explore the idea of living in exponential times. Uh, Marina, can I ask that you click until the word data is on the screen? Thank you. So the first thing we're seeing here is a formula for exponentiation, which is um, not all that complicated maths, but something that doesn't come very intuitively to humans. Humans find it very difficult to spot exponential patterns because until the last hundred years or so, nature didn't really support them. Nothing was allowed this runaway idea of, of doubling and growth. Um, it was always pulled into play by natural forces. And that was because we had things that were being consumed um, and therefore used up. Now, the technologies we're going to talk about, these exponential technologies, things aren't being consumed. We're sort of letting the powers of our, our brain um, play in a space where the inputs are no longer restricted. And I think the other um, speakers will highlight this with, with many more tangible examples. I'm going to talk about the first idea of exponential growth that many of us were exposed to, and that was from Moore's law. When Gordon Moore um, first observed that the number of semiconductors he was fitting onto a silicon wafer um, was doubling every year or so. And he, in fact, coined this idea of the number of um, transistors or logical gates on a chip doubling every year or so off only four observations, 1961, 62, 63, and 64. What we may not appreciate is that he actually rescinded his law um, three or four times in his career. He said, look, it's kept going, um, but it's got to stop. But in actual fact, the exponential performance of hardware has kept doubling roughly every 18 months um, from the 60s up until today. And there's a couple of ways that that is made tangible. One of them is this idea that your mobile phone has more power than the Clinton administration had at its disposal during his presidency. Uh, the one I prefer is the uh, greeting card you buy at a newsagent that plays happy birthday when you open it um, for a buck fifty, which is then promptly thrown in the bin, contains more computing power than the whole world had in the 1950s put together. So such is the nature of the exponential growth of computing. We're going to have near free ubiquitous computing power beyond our wildest dreams as we continue this exponential curve um, driven by things like quantum computing and other things we're going to hear more about. But this idea that if you actually consider the metric of performance per dollar, then you actually see exponential technologies in things like storage, not just hard drives or solid state storage, but all mediums of storage are actually on this exponential growth trend performance per dollar. So too communications, communication networks, our ability to move information around uh, is performing exponentially in terms of performance per dollar. Data itself, so-called big data, something which I actually don't believe in, uh, data has always been growing exponentially in terms of the velocity, the volume of the data, the variety of that data. Um, and, and it is another exponential technology. If we can go to the next slide. Thanks, Marina. Um, and let's bring it up the whole way until you see the word, um, until you see artificial intelligence, my favorite. So trust, technologies of trust. Um, things like distributed ledgers, exponential technologies in their infancy, but a whole new realm of distributed trust solutions based on mathematics and computing power. Automation, whether it's robotic process automation, which itself is just computer scripts, or whether it's intelligent automation, there's also a whole bunch of technologies that are increasing exponentially and very quickly taking us to some place we've never seen. IoT. Um, really a whole domain of different technologies underpinning a lot of it is things like batteries um, and memory and miniaturization and sensors all increasing in terms of performance per dollar so the number of connected things talking to each other automatically and this this one's three dollars um, it's an internet connected computer again rivaling um, the mainframes of the, of the 70s and 80s now just as a disposable connected technology what does it mean when everything's connected and AI, which I'll spend a little bit more time on, but the last point, please, Marina, is that all of these exponential technologies are actually supporting and reinforcing each other. So the exponential growth of AI is 
even more astounding when we realize that the information collected by all of these exponential sensors on the Internet of Things is flowing around through exponential communication networks um, and therefore able to be stored on exponential storage technologies, which can be crunched using exponential computing power. So if we turn to the next slide, I want to dive into AI just quickly. This idea that it's going to contribute the amount of the current GDP of India and China put together um, over the next 10 years will be created through this group of technologies or as the next point mentions many of the CEOs we survey in fact almost three quarters of them believe it will substantially change how they'll do their business but what is it um, I like to think of it along a couple of spectrums if you um, pull up the next couple of points please the idea that to make it attainable, what is intelligence? Let's start with something very narrow, doing something very simple, let's say playing noughts and crosses. Um, we don't think of that as artificially intelligent anymore, but there was a time when the idea of a computer playing a passable game of noughts and crosses was pure fantasy. Of course, we discard that. We realize it's a really small game tree. There's only 65,000 games of noughts and crosses that are possible. But something more complex like chess or even more complex than that like Go, where we can't just brute force it, we now have computers playing um, beyond human grandmaster levels using all kinds of clever heuristics and different forms of adversarial neural networks. So we accept that computers can do narrow things like play a game very, very well. But we're now moving across this spectrum to things like computer vision is exponentially improving with algorithms like you only look once and with um, variations on that allows them to recognize faces even with masks on nowadays. Um, and the surveillance state that's acceptable in many countries around the world is leveraging this technology and it's challenging many other Western countries in how do they generally feel about the fact that computers can see and tell humans apart. Computers can drive cars um, and have to make decisions about what's the better accident to have if you have to have an accident. So general intelligence is behaving more and more like humans. And we know that computers have passed the Turing test, which is fooling a human into believing that it's a human um, for well over five or six years now. So conceivable chatbots and digital assistants and digital concierges are actually realities that we help our customers with and our clients every day. Another important dimension to put across this narrow general spectrum is the idea to which we leave humans in the loop. Um, and if we fast forward to the next slide and the four points on it, please, Marina, I think it's really um, interesting to consider if it's narrow and we leave humans in the loop we want to call that assisted intelligence we're helping someone do something many times over um, whether it's checking that the salami is evenly distributed on a pizza um, or whether it's perhaps helping assess a credit loan where there's still a human in the loop if it becomes more general it's an augmented intelligence think about computers helping doctors um, with general medical scans or checking against large databases for more general disease profiles it's when we take the humans out of the loop. Now, it might be narrow. It might be simply automated, some sort of intelligent automation process, or it might be fully autonomous, like driving a car or a heavy vehicle. So it's very general purpose and the humans are out of the loop. Clearly huge potential benefits to society, but also new profiles of risk. And what I think is going to be a huge growth area in the years to come as these exponential technologies completely reshape how we interact with the world is how do we address these risks? A whole new set of risks have emerged. What do we have to look out for? So if we can look at the next slide, in, in, in my role with, with PwC, which traditionally stood for Audit of Financial Statements, we're thinking about the commoditization of AI, the democratization of this technology and the open source movement and the near free computing power that allows you to crunch it. We're going to have to have standards around the governance of this technology not ideas that it should be governed, standards. We're gonna to have to have regulation that works cross jurisdiction, and we're gonna to have to have ethical frameworks that aren't sort of lofty and untangible, but are actually usable and able to be implemented and understood by consumers. In the middle, we're gonna to need to agree, how do we monitor the performance of these very complicated algorithms? Um, by nature, they're difficult to understand, but we need to feel secure that they are, um, that the bias is understood, that they're fair, that they're interpretable and explainable, um, and that they're robust and secure, which is the AI equivalent, if you like, of cyber security, the security for AI. So the idea behind this focus on responsible AI is, 
I'm incredibly bullish about all the fantastic things these technologies will bring humankind, but I do acknowledge that on the other side of the coin, we've now got a whole bunch of different risks, which we need to monitor in terms of are they appropriately governed? How are we measuring the performance ongoing? And what is the ethical framework by which we make the decision to take the human out of the loop and allow the machine to learn along that more general AI spectrum? The end of my bit. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Matt. Um, appreciate that. And you, I think you've stuck to time too, so that's also appreciated. Uh, I already have uh, some questions coming through, so we'll just come back to those. Uh, and you certainly raised a lot of um, interesting points that, that we will uh, explore further. Uh, if I can now introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Shelley Wickham. Uh, Shelley is a senior lecturer in physics and chemistry, ARC DECRA fellow and Westpac research fellow at Sydney University. As a member of the DNA nanotechnology group at the Sydney Nano Institute, one of uh, Shelley's research projects include nanorobotics, uh, nan nanorobots and DNA origami, including the building of autonomous programmable nanorobots to navigate through the body to detect and treat early disease. So fascinated to hear about that. Um, so Shelley, um, I can't see you on the screen anywhere. Where have you gone? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. If you are, there awesome. you are, good, perfect. Thank you, over to you. I think you're Great, on mute. Yes, there you go. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So, Marina, could we go to the first slide? Just the first click, though. Um, so, what I wanted to start with, um, similar to Matt, I guess, is the problem that we're looking at, which is the idea of um, that we pose to to surgeons, actually asking medical specialists. What would they do differently? So if you take the science fiction sort of imagination approach and say, if you go into the body and you could see inside the body as if you were physically placed there, how would it change what you do as a doctor? Um, and we got some really interesting responses from that question. So this idea that if you could miniaturize yourself in the body, how would you do your medicine differently? And in particular, when we were talking to cardiovascular surgeons, they were very excited about the idea that you could detect early stage heart disease. Um, so in this figure here, this sort of yellow patch there represents the early stages of heart disease, which we can't currently diagnose. And so the idea is that we could potentially change the way this kind of disease is treated with much better outcomes. And as technologists, our approach was to say, OK, so how do we make something that could go in the body and see that? So if we could go to the next slide. This is our vision of basically, as um, Ron described, nanorobots. So basically, you see at the bottom there are a red blood cell um, that makes up your blood. They're about six microns in size, so 0. 0.00006 of a centimeter. And our nanorobots are about 10 times smaller than that. They're about 600 nanometers. And there'll be more slides on what I exactly I mean by nano there. But just suffice to say, very much smaller than a cell so that they could you could easily have very many of them going through your arteries. And in this case, congregating around potentially early stage heart disease and helping to treat or diagnose it. So that's the, the vision. That's the grand challenge we're approaching. So I'm going to sort of go through some of the science that Ron suggested um, briefly, but basically you're going to have these three terms explained, don't worry. So we have DNA, and by DNA I just mean the ordinary DNA that's in your cells. We're taking DNA that you've heard of in this picture here, this is the DNA double helix, but we're not using it the way biology does, we're taking it out of the cell and we're basically using it like a building material. It's like a type of smart Lego that we can use to self-assemble small nanostructures like those nanorobots that we want to make. And if you click one slide on, Marina. Um, and then origami, the way I'm using the word origami is exactly how you're thinking of it, folding up a piece of paper. But instead of folding up paper, we're folding up DNA. And one more click. This is just, again, this is how small we're thinking. So if we have a human hair, 
we're saying that we're about a thousand times smaller than a human hair. That's how big some of these nanobots are going to be. So next slide. Um, and this is a really fun project to work on because it brings together uh, a really great combination that I love, which is design and creativity with science. Because once you start thinking of, you know, should this be a little submarine that goes through your blood? What should this nano robot look like? You really have to let go of any of your preconceptions of how they might look to find what is the ideal shape for these nano robots. So this was some of our initial like brainstorming how our nano robots going to look. So some of these look a bit like viruses. Some of them look like something you might be in a, see in a sci-fi movie, but they all sort of have similar features, like they might have legs to move around, they might have bodies that um, have some sort of computation integrated into them, and they also have sensors for the environment. Um, if you can go forward one. Um, so the next slide shows basically the, the de design idea that we coalesced on, which is this idea of, well, I don't quite see the slide. Um, here we go. Yeah, so this is kind of our design principle that it's going to have a body, it's going to have these multifunctional hands that are going to do different things like clamp and claw, maybe sense things, maybe detect them like a camera, and things to sort of signal outside of the body. And it's going to be made of DNA. And the next few slides I'm going to describe to you briefly how you might actually make something out of DNA. So we like DNA as a building material, um, if we can move to the next slide, for several reasons. Firstly, it's biocompatible, it's biodegradable, so generally it has a good toxicity in the body, it's pretty well, um, pretty well adapted to by the body, and it's programmable. So this is coming back to DNA as an information storing polymer. It can store your genetic information to grow your cells into a human being, um, but it can also store structural information about which parts of DNA uh, bind to which other parts of DNA. So you can imagine it's like smart Lego that knows where it goes. So instead of putting the Lego bricks together, you basically put your smart DNA Lego bricks in a bag, shake it up, and then the structure is formed by itself. That's what we mean by self-assembly. And in this case, this is the concept of the DNA origami. So in regular origami, you take a two-dimensional sheet of paper and you'd fold that up into a three-dimensional object. So in this case, a paper crane. Um, in our case, we take a long piece of DNA, so a one-dimensional object, and we fold that up and we cross-link it with these strands that we call staples, and it folds into a two-dimensional or three-dimensional DNA origami. And people have actually made these nano smiley faces. So next slide. Um, and so I was just wanted to show you, uh, you know, a bunch of pictures. Um, one thing that really attracted to me to this field of science is I like images and I guess like the young people, if you don't see a picture, it doesn't seem real. Um, so here's some pictures of things different research groups have built out of DNA origami. So this was the first thing that looks a little bit like a DNA robot. Um, and what you see below the schematic is uh, an electron microscope image. So I'm actually, my background picture is an electron microscope. So we use some pretty advanced technology to see these things, but you can see these individual molecules that have been folded up into robot shapes. And we think here, this is about um, maybe 20 times smaller than that robot I initially designed. People have also made capsules. So this is a capsule that only opens when it reaches certain cancer cells. And so it delivers drugs selectively to a cancer cell. Um, and the next one is, this is a little bit like a, de a little nano reactor. So this is a bit like, you know, a large scale reactor that you might have in a power plant, but it's made of nanoparticles. So it can sort of couple enzymes together for more efficient chemical reactions. So those are the types of things people have made. And if we go to the next slide, um, there's a lot of very creative people in this field. Um, so people have made like nano vases. So again, these are like all, you know, a thousand times smaller than your, your hair. People have made, this is like a little man, a Coke bottle, a little bunny rabbit. That's a common motif in graphic, uh, digital graphics. 
a space shuttle, a little alien face, and a love heart. So people, we can make all of these shapes that are very complex and very detailed, and these are all at the right scale to make these nanorobots. Um, and one more slide of cool pictures is, and I really like the artist's interpretation of some of these, because this robot is made from DNA, but he's tearing apart a giant piece of DNA. Um, but the figure here shows that I said this is even more three dimensions because it's kind of four dimensional, but if we show the next one, this one can actually flap its arms up and down. So there's starting to be things that exist that look like these nano robots, but they can also move and start to perform functions, um, like either opening to deliver a drug or flapping arms to move around or things like that. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of but this isn't science fiction. Like these are things that we can start to make and do. And what we're doing is sort of turning our science fiction into anatomy. So if you want to just bring these all up, Marina, um, we're working on is making these like multifunctional nanoparticles now with a core that they can move around. They can sense things like those early stage uh, lesions that indicate heart disease. They can react and perform computations to detect them and then interact so sort of deliver that information out of the body. Um, if we go one more, if I try and... Oh yeah, so here's some kind of things that we're doing. Um, so we're making right now the core. So in this case, we're making these larger nanostructures. So these need to be about 20 times bigger than what we made previously. You can see we made this one in a little dog shape just because we like to be creative about that. And we're also making these microfluidic devices to test them. So in this case, you know, it's difficult to test these um, and see if they're acting the way they're supposed to. So we have these basically, it's like a blood vessel on a chip where you have a, a device that basically simulates blood flow and you can use human blood to understand how these things would interact with the body, um, but using microscopes outside the body. And I think we've got one more slide. Um, Something that we're really interested in is, it ties into the talk before, this idea that these are sort of simple agents, they're very, uh, they have complexity, but they, they have limited functions, but that you could potentially have emergent behaviors of artificial intelligence through them working together, a bit like the way we see in um, ants' nests or, or bee swarms and things like that. And that's what we want to follow up now is how the behavior of these can interact in interesting ways. I think that's the end of my slides. Oh, that's yeah. So, oh, you got one more? Go for it. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is just to say um, there's lots of ways for the community to get involved in this types of research. We interestingly have some different opportunities in particular for citizen science. So I guess it's hard to do this in person now, but we do have some community interaction programs. Thanks. Thanks, Shelley. That's uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'll now introduce uh, Dr. Kobe Lyons. And um, Dr. Lyons is Senior Research Fellow in Digital Ethics, School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne and a PhD candidate at Melbourne Law School. Her research interests are nano, emerging tech, law, AI and the law of armed conflict which I'm sure we're going to explore uh, a bit more. Kobe is currently conducting research on the impact of legislation on individuals, particularly in relation to Australian laws governing cyber, uh, which is obviously a very topical um, point at the moment. So uh, Dr. Kobe Lyons, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ron. Really appreciate the introduction. I'm just so delighted to be giving a presentation where someone has already framed two of the parts of my presentation. It couldn't actually be better. So I want to say thank you for the presentation on AI. And it's so rare for me to be on a panel where someone speaks about nanomaterials because I am almost inevitably tacked on at the end as the female who talks about nanomaterials. So what I'm going to do differently from the previous two panelists who've talked about the wonders and the magic and the awe and the beauty is I'm going to talk about all the dark, terrible things. And in particular, I'm going to start off with nano because my thesis was actually looking at hostile uses of nano. So if you can imagine what Shelley has just talked about and all these wonderful opportunities that arise from folding nano origami to delivery, to deliver drugs or to sense, or as Matt also highlighted, 
to create sensors or to even make batteries smaller. Nanomaterials have a really wide range of applications. Every single application that you can think of that has a positive or a potential positive impact has also got a potential risk. And this is where I come into the picture. So the research that I was doing in my, in my PhD was looking at the materials that are used. So first of all, I spent a couple of years just getting across what nanomaterials were. So Shelley, you've done a wonderful job in summarizing it in a short period of time. And then turning around and thinking about, okay, we have these, this body of international law that prohibits certain types of behaviors on the battlefield. What's happening now and what's the, what are the next five to 10 years going to look like? And I didn't want to write, partially because it wouldn't have been uh, potentially successful, but I didn't want to write a PhD that was science fiction. I didn't want to write something that was entirely hypothetical. And so what I did, I did was I picked three specific applications of nanomaterials. But before I explain to you where I ended, I'm going to just go back to the very beginning because I think a lot of these futuristic talks, we often forget that what we're talking about is, at least in the context of my research and I suspect most of our research, a lot of it is actually really, really old. And I heard Ramona Caval give a talk on the whispering of bones in 2017. This is at a Wheeler Centre event where she talked about Skull 5. Some of you may have already heard of Skull 5. So in 2013, Skull 5 was a, a 1.8 million year old skull was found in Georgia on the Armenian border. And what was really interesting about Skull 5 was that he was clearly really, really old. His teeth were worn down. He was clearly incapable of caring for himself. And it looked as though someone really carefully nurtured this particular individual and kept them safe. But right next to this skull that had been nurtured and loved was also a pile of stones. And this is taken to be evidence of possibly the oldest battle site where a big pile of stones that were 1.8 million years old were used to protect this, this individual who was clearly unable to defend him or herself. So this tension between using technology, even though we don't necessarily think about rocks as technology, this tension between using technology to help to build or to help to protect, I'm sure those same stones will help to grind down food for this poor individual who was missing teeth, those same tools being used to then also harm others is not a new thing. We've had this dichotomy, but this tension between science and harm as long as we've had uh, scientific tools. And in particular, most many of you would already be familiar with the Manhattan Project and that that sort of moment, that epiphany of what uh, physics was capable of achieving, which I think it's fair to say has shaped the discipline going forward. What's happening now in the area of work that I'm in now is looking at a combination of what Matt was talking about and what Shelley was talking about. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at computer science and I'm looking at, when I say computer science, it's actually a misnomer. There are many different fields within computer science and looking at how they're each developing and what they're thinking about. And they're at different stages of maturity in terms of thinking about what the risks are and how their tools can be misused. So I'll give just one example in terms of the work that I'm doing now, and then I'll skip back to what the PhD conclusions were just to round out the, the presentation. But in terms of the work that I'm doing now, the natural lang language processing crowd had a presentation at a recent conference, which was automating sentencing all the way through to uh, a final judgment without any judge or any human involved. So it was just picking previous cases and saying on the basis of the, these basis of these particular cases, the likely outcome is this. We can skip all of the costs and the palaver of lawyers. We don't even need a judge. Why don't we do this? And this modelling even included sentencing up to and including the death penalty in the presentation that was given. So some people within the community very rightly said, hold on, this is a little bit problematic. We need some ethical thinking around this. And so they told the authors, or when, when the paper was submitted, the authors were told to go away and to have a little think about what the ethical implications of their work were. They then did that, they wrote the paragraph and they still presented their paper at this conference. So what I'm doing is helping to write into these conferences or to write into these communities more, more accurately to, to help them to think about some of the issues that are arising and the risks. So as these technologies that Matt is describing have incredible power and incredible, incredibly positive attributes, there are also really enormous harms that can happen at speed and at a scale that we haven't seen before. And we've seen some of that with the IB predictive grading, again, in the UK with the students' predictive grades. So I think some of you will be familiar with some of these stories, but just to contextualize that a little bit. Back to the nanomaterials. What's really interesting is that a lot of the work that's happening on nanomaterials is now actually being expedited 
through AI. And one of the most interesting cases we saw was earlier this year where AI was used to predict the property of cells and then those cells were manually put together in a way that then created new organisms that stayed alive for some days. So xenobots are a really interesting study. They didn't stay along per alive permanently. They didn't pose a permanent risk. But this longer term question of, again, if we as we expedite what we're able to think about, how we think about it, and to then bring that into the biological world, world has incredibly broad implications. And so when it comes to nanomaterials, some of some of these nano advances are already being used on the battlefield. One of the biggest areas that I think is, is challenging is looking at uh, the genetic side of things. So when you can tamper with genes or you can interfere with people's genes, another area I looked at was optogenetics. So when you can insert a virus and then remotely control emotion, again, none of this is science fiction. It's actually being researched and looked into now. I don't want to predict what's going to happen in 2040, but I know that there are a lot of things that are advancing now. And one of the things I think we don't do enough of, which I think Matt also highlighted, is that we don't integrate the thinking around the different technologies. So there'll be someone usually on one of these panels who think about nano, someone who thinks about computer science, someone who thinks about uh, another area that, you know, they're usually the usual, the killer robots crowd. But what's really interesting is that those technologies are all going to merge together. There is going to be a point where the expedited thought processes provided by AI, with AI are going to facilitate biological advances, but also advances in drone technology and other technologies. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate that, Kobe. That's um, a, a, again blurred lines between uh, science fiction and reality, and I'll come back to that as well. Our final speaker today is uh, Professor Gavin Brennan, uh, who um, <clears throat> leads a research group working on quantum information theory spanning quantum stimulation and computation and quantum sensing. Gavin hails from Fairbanks, Alaska and completed his PhD studies at the University of New Mexico, followed by work at uh, a postdoc at NIST Gatesburg. So Professor Gavin Brennan, uh, all yours, thank you. Hi, thank you, pleasure. So yeah, I'm uh, currently at Macquarie University and um, I am in this field called quantum information technology. And uh, it's really harkens back to work that started uh, essentially a century ago after the, the 1918 pandemic, uh, which found that nature has this funny behavior where things that you thought would be certain actually end up being probabilistic. And this upset a lot of the physicists at the time, but that's what nature does and that's we've got to deal with it. And what was exciting is um, through the, the 40s and 50s and 60s, people realized that they could make use of the effects of this new kind of phenomenon, quantum mechanics, to bring new technologies. And so this brought about things like the transistor, of course, which has been tremendously impactful in uh, modern day computers, as well as uh, even more portable devices and cell phones and so forth. Uh, lasers, which uh, no one imagined the kind of influence those would have in terms of communications and precision uh, manufacturing, and uh, superconductors, which offered a route to have lossless transmission of energy, although we're still searching for a uh, high temperature superconductor that would be cheap enough to deploy over large distances. So these were all fantastic discoveries made in the laboratories and people didn't really have any clear view of how impactful they would be. But we are actually in the midst of a second quantum revolution now, which uh, we can just for the moment call quantum 2.0. And this is actually harnessing important and new properties of quantum mechanics that previous technologies weren't sophisticated enough to use. And they go under two words, entanglements and superposition. And it has to do with how particles in quantum mechanics behave. They can be in a, a superposition of different states, which could mean different energy states, different positions, different spins. And entanglement is a kind of correlation between separate quantum particles. 
And if you use these features, which requires tremendously carefully designed technologies, which only are really available or started to be available in the past 20 years, then you get really fantastic new features. So here on this slide, I've just shown three existing products or processes which uh, have been demonstrated just in the past couple of years. Uh, I'm on the upper right is an actual uh, quantum computing device. This is um, a um, superconducting quantum processor from Google. It's uh, using the bristle cone chip, which is consists of 72 quantum bits or known as qubits. And it's a massive thing. You know, this is something that requires lots of coolants, um, you know, a, a big uh, a big warehouse to store the electronics and the cooling equipment. And it's using all superconducting technologies. But it is, you know, one of the, the first quantum devices to hit our planet. Um, the one on the bottom right is a quantum sensor. This is uh, what's called a gravimeter. It's a device which can sensitively measure gravitational fields. And it was deployed on a ship and they showed that uh, this device outperformed uh, spring-based gravimeters. Um, and the one on the bottom left is a depiction of an experiment which was successfully performed by the Chinese government to demonstrate uh, secure transmission of information using quantum cryptography. So they it shared entanglement between one Chinese city and a, and a satellite, and then a second Chinese city and a satellite. And because of the unique features of quantum entanglements, they were able to establish a shared key between those two cities that were separated by about 1200 kilometers, which would not be breakable by any of today's computers and also would not be breakable by any future quantum computers. Uh, yeah, next slide. So here we are. Um, you know, a lot of this research in, in quantum is really, you know, like when I started out in PhD studies, you know, it was it was really quite a rather new area. And, you know, most of the new research was happening at the Blackboard or in, in small laboratories. But the funding has increased tremendously. So just over the past five years, we've seen an increase in government funding um, in Australia at the level of 80 million US dollars to 150 million. Um, and, uh, you know, there are several countries now that have over $1 billion investment, including India, the EU, the US, and China is leading things with a $10 billion investment in quantum technologies. Um, there's also been a substantial increase in investment from the private sector. So if you look at the upper right, there is a depiction of uh, companies that were involved with quantum computing prior to the year 2015. And there are really only a handful of them, including IBM, Google, Microsoft, Toshiba, and Lockheed Martin, and a very, very tiny number of startup companies. And just over the past five years, we've seen really an explosion of companies that have come out. Um, and uh, you can get an update of the companies that are involved in this worldwide by looking at the uh, website quantumcomputingreport.com. I think there's the last count I remember there being about 150. So it's, it's still small compared to worldwide technological investments, but it's rapidly growing. And uh, there are some companies here in Australia, including Silicon Quantum Computing, Q Control, Quintessence, who are uh, working directly in this area. And um, Australia is, is actually a great place to um, start up a quantum technology company. Um, and uh, I should say that the, there's, there's people working in both the hardware and software side. So people actually building devices like miniature quantum computers and also people working out the software that will run on these future quantum computers. All right, let's go to the next slide. So yeah, I'm going to make some some bold predictions about what kinds of technologies coming from quantum tech, quantum uh, science 
could be on our planet by the year 2040. Um, and the, the first area is probably the one that gets most people excited and also scared, which is um, data security. So it was shown by a uh, mathematician named Peter Shore back in 1995 that quantum computers can crack the most common forms of public key cryptography. So we use public key cryptography all the time to have secure transactions. For example, when you buy something over the internet on Amazon, you're frequently using public key cryptography when you send your credit card information. Um, and um, we rely on it because we trust mathematics. We have uh, we had very good promise that normal computers would have an extremely hard time cracking this kind of cryptography. And um, what was astounding is that that security assumption was based upon what was known about the classical laws of physics. But quantum laws give you some new features, and Peter Shore showed that, in fact, you can take something which becomes exponentially hard to solve on a classical machine, so even it would be hopeless for a, the bank of the world's best supercomputers to try to crack this crypto to something which is absolutely achievable. And I know in these talks you're not supposed to present equations but and figures, but I did so anyway. On the upper right hand side, you see a plot of um, the time it would take the number of operations to crack a cryptographic code with the digits given by this the, the horizontal axis. And the red curve shows this is in a, in a uh, log plot. So uh, the red curve is showing that the cost to do this on a classical CPU is growing exponentially with the digits of your public key. Um, and for example, to, to you know crack something of 232 digits would require thousands of CPU hours, whereas in a quantum computer, such a key could be broken in 26 hours. And um, not only is public key crypto uh, vulnerable to quantum computers, but also any kind of contracts or transactions using digital signatures, which includes um, all blockchain activities, including secure voting, medical record access, and cryptocurrency transactions, would be vulnerable to quantum computers. In fact, the digital signatures would be vulnerable on a shorter time scale than cracking um, uh, public key cryptography like RSA encryption. So uh, this has certainly gained a lot of uh, attention from the intelligence agencies around the world, um, and um, people are paying attention and trying to come up with new and more safe types of cryptography called post-quantum cryptography. Um, another area where we'll, I think we're going to see a lot of progress by the year 2040 is in ultra-fast quantum algorithms. And the idea here is that you could take a problem that you have, whether it come from engineering or finance or chemistry or biology, translate it into an algorithm that could be run on a quantum computer and get an answer quite quickly. So some things that are being looked at right now, including designer chemistry, um, uh, better pharmaceutical design, energy efficient fertilizer production, all available from essentially running quantum chemistry on a quantum computer, which is where it should be run. Um, and this also has impact for other areas less sciencey, including things like finance. So you might try to translate a problem of investment arbitrage into a quantum algorithm, and uh, people have done this. And um, what's interesting about arbitrage actually is that it is in what's called an NP-complete problem. So it's a very hard problem to solve, and quantum computers certainly aren't expected to solve NP-complete problems, but they can give you, in principle, much better and faster uh, outcomes for uh, optimizing investment portfolios. There's also some interesting consequences associated with uh, game theoretic strategies that arise if you imagine many different competing 
players for actually, for example, different financial institutions who which would each have access to quantum computers and they would be competing to try to optimize investment portfolios. And a final area, which is quite exciting, which I work in um, a fair amount, about half the time metrology and half the time quantum computing is on um, building pre ultra precise sensors that use quantum technologies. So um, these could include things like gravimeters that uh, we saw an image of before where you would be able to take a device and perhaps put it on a ship or on an aircraft and precisely survey the strength of the gravitational field over an area or over the entire planet even. And based upon variations in the density of Earth, you could de detect whether there is a source of minerals, for example, diamonds. Or you could see if there is a hole available, which could be used to you know, be a source for, uh, for carbon sequestration or finding water aquifers. So uh, all these precise sensors can have tremendous impacts in uh, commercial activities. And uh, there are other sensors, for example, inertial sensors which could be used for navigation in the case of GPS denied environments, for example, in a battlefield scenario where um, you know, some country knocked out GPS servers and, and you wanna have a way to navigate your ship without those servers, you could do that with ultra precise sensors. And there's also some very interesting work being done in um, in vivo disease detection using quantum spins that are implanted into nanodiamonds, which are non-toxic to humans, and then could be um, used uh, for early disease detection. Okay, let's go to the uh, last slide. So because this is uh, put on by the uh, Australian Society for Computers and Law, I did want to highlight some areas that I would really like to discuss more with people who know a lot more about these things, legal matters or government regulations, because it's just a matter of fact that right now, while the, the environment of quantum technology is very exciting, I love it, that's why I'm in it, it's also, in effect, it's the Wild West. So there aren't a lot of uh, agreed upon regulations for quantum technologies within a country, let alone across countries. And there actually is a, a real need for such things. So for example, standards. You know, we have standards for cryptography, but since I, as I was mentioning, many of the public key cryptography is vulnerable to quantum computers, we need some kind of cryptographic standards for protocols that would be immune to quantum computer attacks. And these are called post-quantum cryptographic standards. And the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US is uh, developing such standards now, and they plan to have recommendations available in uh, 2022 to 2024. But then, you know, countries are going to have to abide by those standards or agree to them through international relationships. Um, there also should be some uh, standards for hardware components. So if you have, you know, a company, <coughs> say, in uh, Singapore that claims to have produced some device which will send you entangled quantum qubits at some rate, how do you know you can trust that what they wrote is correct? Well, we don't have those standards right now because this is all very new technology, but you want to be able to have some, you know, some faith that what you're being sold is in fact what the sellers claimed it to be. So caveat emptor applies also to quantum technologies. Uh, another area is in having sane import-export controls and visa limits. So uh, this is an issue with really all countries involved in quantum tech, but for example, in Australia, we've already defined quantum cryptography and high-performance quantum computers as control technologies in the defense and strategic goods list. Um, so, um, you know, there's good motivation for having the, you know, some controls on this. Uh, given especially some of the, the new information coming out about uh, um, industrial spying and also questions about you know, Chinese involvement in stealing technology. Um, but you also don't want to go overboard. So if you make it too broad a category for regulation, it really stifles innovation and makes it very hard to get anything done without having 
huge regulatory overheads, even getting quality students over because of uh, unnecessarily strict visa limitations. Um, a, a third area is data privacy rights and uh, ultimately some kind of smart contract law. So if you know if anyone's familiar with um, cryptocurrencies, you know that there are also ways to embed uh, contracts within currencies. Um, and some of them get quite sophisticated, like in the Ethereum um, crypto tokens, you can actually have what are a Turing complete algorithms built in to your uh, cryptocurrency. Um, but you know, these are really contracts which were enforced by code, not by a centralized uh, force by design, but still we would want to have at least some sense of um, how these things could fit into contracts which involve things which maybe you want to have a little bit of um, ability to monitor or at least a way to inform users of the potential risks. And just I just want to highlight this point that um, computing power is power and it, it does affect people at a, at a very basic level and um, we need to take it seriously because it affects people's welfare and their their privacy. And I just want to highlight one one friendly thing about quantum technologies is that you can also use them to avoid fraud, with, including things like uh, you could use things like quantum clocks to monitor high speed trading, which gives you a way to actually improve uh, regulation over um, financial transactions to make things more secure. So those are just some of the things, and I think there's probably a few people in the audience or on the team here who probably have some good ideas of how one could get started on thinking about implementing these kinds of regulations. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Gavin, appreciate that. Um, now that leaves me with minus one minute to ask the 20 questions that have come through uh, <laughs> for the audience. I, I've been given instructions that we can go a little bit over time. Uh, I do note though that people are logging off as well as we've gone past the hour. So, what I, I'll, I'll suggest a couple of things. I will ask a couple of questions, give everyone the opportunity to answer those questions. Uh, and what I might suggest, Marina, is that the other questions we have, and there are quite a few in the uh, panel there, we might actually get those printed out and uh, or emailed across and get answers to the uh, people who are asking the questions. And, uh, and that way we can respond to everyone's queries. So uh, I guess the first question to you all, uh, and we sort of crossed lines. I said a bit earlier, we blurred the lines between science fiction and uh, uh, and reality. And and, we, and and I've asked the question of a previous panel around uh, the reality of Hollywood versus versus real. Uh, and I guess to quote then uh, William Gibson, who said this, the sci-fi writer is the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. Do you agree with the comments? I'm going to merge a couple of questions here. How do you see the technology can be made more inclusive? And where is this technology going to take us in the next five to 10 years in terms of what we're going to be able to do? That's an open question to each of the panelists. Uh, and uh, and then uh, I'll pick up some themes after that. Uh, so maybe uh, we'll start in the order we went through in the speech. So Matt, if you can go first in in, in uh, responding to the, those questions. Look, a lot of what we're talking about um, starts with fundamentals in computer science. Uh, I love what I believe Germany did a few years ago that every eight year old kid in the country got a computer that they could experiment with. Um, we should we should have more computing given in the school curriculum early and younger and get them started early and that will democratize and spread that stuff out. Oh, good. Nice and succinct. Thank you. Uh, Shelley, your response. Yeah, so I guess um, mine is like to yeah, basically have the ongoing conversation. I guess as scientists, maybe often we have a bit of a blind spot for inclusivity. And to, to have those conversations early in the field and to also have the conversation about, I guess, similar to what Kobe was talking about, is like, how can we do good? And also, how can we ensure that our technology won't be used beyond our expectations to, to basically do harm? And have that built into new scientific fields, like from the beginning and have, you know, our students and our PhD students 
educated to think about those questions from the very ground up in a new scientific field. And Kobe? That's my answer. I had the same answer. No, sorry, that, that wasn't me. Um, I completely agree with Matt. That was Shelley again. I think that education is key. So in the Ukraine, they've also got an incredible incredible uh, education program to advise about information, mis misinformation and disinformation, particularly given where the Ukraine sits, and that's been incredibly effective. So education is one part of it. But what we haven't even mentioned is that fundamental inequality sits in Australia. Lots of people don't have access to technology in Australia. This is not something that is equally spread out in response to your quote. So it's not just something that we need to think about in the future. It's something we need yeah. to think about right now, not to mention the people who are building and contemplating both the software and the hardware, who tend to be very homogenous very exclusive and we see major problems when those tools are rolled, rolled out further down the track. That was me. Uh, thank you, Kobe. I, I've now got the different voices. Uh, so, uh, and, and Gavin, yourself? Um, yeah, actually, you know, one thing that's definitely come into my mind a lot is um, inequality that will increase likely with access to very powerful technologies like quantum technologies. Um, you know, computing is power and the the wealthier countries having access to these technologies will will see their their advantage competitively grow substantially over um, third world countries who just don't. Um, so I think we're going to have to think seriously about how we can make this equitable at international scale. Um, and at a national scale, yeah, I certainly agree with the previous speakers that um, education is key. It has to start early and, um, you know, even if you can get a few people from, um, you know, more disadvantaged communities interested in, in starting to talk to them and working with them, it makes a big difference because they, they talk to others and the, the information spreads. But it, it's something that has to it has to be a concerted effort. You have to think about and do about it actively. It's not a, a secondary thing. Uh, just on that point of equality, I, I, I would suggest that uh, even from a uh, economic perspective, Australia needs to ensure that it remains a producer of technology, not just a consumer. Otherwise, we'll lose that competitiveness in a global scale as well. I'm going to ask uh, one of the questions from the panel, uh, or the, the Q&A panel from Evan, because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of extension to that question. And one of the main issues in AI ethics is that we human beings are the source for machines. The issue with this is that our biases are bundled up in that. My question or Evan's question is, how do we and can we disassociate the human from the machine, particularly when discussing black box AI? So back to you, Matt, and I'll go around the table again. You're on mute, Matt. I'm not sure there's a there's a simple answer to that. Um, you know, I think I think setting and agreeing standards and being open and transparent as much as we can in the various ways of assessing and and providing explainability and transparency of black box AI um, and agreement around what different tests for bias, not just in the machine, but in the data fed to the machine look like. So I think agreement and alignment around standards and tools, preferably through something quite open source um, and freely available is part of the way there. Thank you. Back to you, Shelley. Yeah, I agree that transparency is, is a really important part of that. Say in the medical fields, we are seeing more things like the ability to edit the human genes in, in like, for example, uh, babies before they're born and, and just like having active conversations about oh, somebody's phone's ringing. Um, having active conversations about that, and you know, as a society, that we get towards a, a shared consensus of what is and is an acceptable use of those technologies. And Kobe, I'm going to be controversial. No nice answers for me. I don't think we can disassociate them. I think we're talking about systems systems now that are so complicated that involve both software and hardware and people that require responsibility. And in every presentation I give, I talk about how there is existing law. This is part of the project that I'm working on. We have a wide range of laws that hold people to account. What we don't have is a similar uh, framework for accountability for AI just yet. But as I've 
posted this as an answer to one of the questions. Standards Australia is very active in this space. I'm working on a number of uh, AI standards that both define what AI is, but also provide uh, accountability frameworks from a corporate perspective, which would appeal to you, Ron, so that directors from the top down and from the bottom up are going to need to be accountable for these tools being used because they're powerful. That was all for me. Fully agree, absolutely, and good point. Thank you very much. And uh, Gavin? Yeah, I, I don't have anything really more to add. I, I agree with those points. So, um, Marina, I'm um, going, I've realised we, we've still got another uh, 15, 16, maybe more questions. So I suggest that we do uh, get those sent to the speakers and uh, and get responses back because there's some terrific questions in there. I'm just conscious of time. Sure. Uh, but yeah. uh, to wrap up, Professor Matt Cooper-Holtz, uh, Dr. Shelley Wickham, uh, Dr. Kobe Lyons and Professor Gavin Brennan, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Uh, Marina, back to you. Thank you, and uh, and thank you for running as best we could to time. Obviously, there are, you know, there there are many topics to be discussed, and hopefully, we'll have future tech futures seminars where we can hear more, we uh, and allocate more time to all our speakers. Uh, thank you all very much for your time. I have um, some very quick announcements to make. As mentioned earlier, on the 28th of October, we do have a common futures panel, which tries to address some of these issues about by design. So compassion by design, privacy by design, incorporating that in the early stages, as, as Shelley pointed out, in when we're training people and designing systems to have those, those aspects already planned for. But for this month, uh, we have a number of other future uh, talks. One is the, the future of fintech, as you can see on your screen. Uh, and I'll run through these very quickly. The future of work, which is in the same week um, with Andrea Glorioso from the European Commission. Uh, it should be a very interesting talk. And all of these, of course, are free. If you join as members, you'll, you'll have reminders. And, and then we also have a skills workshop, recognising that as lawyers, we have to be more than just black letter lawyers. And there's a whole set of skills that would help us do our job well. So those are the speakers on that panel there. Um, with nice red underlining for potential spelling mistakes. <laughs> um, I hope you um, can laugh with me on that. Now, why the fish? Um, this is really a tribute to Douglas Adams. You know, um, thank you for all the fish and, and have a lovely evening. Um, but just to also let you know, if you feel a bit, um, you know, caved in at home or you're under lockdown restrictions and you, you want to reach out for some friends online, well, we can provide you that platform. We'll be looking at science fiction and have scientists also talk about it and say, well, yes, actually, this is looking awfully like uh, reality and, and have a, you know, a, an online book club with a little difference. So if you like to join that, you're more than welcome also without charge, but it's our community outreach project. If you would like any more information, please reach out to me. But once again, thank you again to all our wonderful panellists and for Ron for chairing and co-hosting this event. It's been an absolute delight. Enjoy your evening and we hope to be back with you soon. Bye for now. Thank you.